Previously on the Lobby USA, our undercover reporter revealed tactics used against supporters of Palestinian equal rights. You have to show that they're racist hate groups and to consistently portray them that way. Tony is being recruited to work undercover for the lobby. It's a hostile environment and there's no risk involved. His assignment? To investigate people on a blacklist drawn up by a website called Canary Mission. It's an anonymous site. Nobody has any idea who's actually running this thing, and people have tried and looked into it. In the third of a four-part series, personal attacks, smears on anonymous websites, how sections of the pro-Israel lobby use unscrupulous means to discredit supporters of Palestinian civil rights. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Getting $38 billion in security in Israel matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby, led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. It seems to be achieving its goals. It threatens future Americans for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. That means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. The Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory. Not for everybody. During his summer in Washington, Tony investigated how the lobby is responding to the growing support for BDS among students. APAC has an established network across high schools and universities and is also part of the wider campus coalition against BDS. I work with the DC schools, so I can connect you to Georgetown, GW, American. I think that you would really benefit from a conversation with the Israel on Campus Coalition. They also coordinate a lot between organizations. So like APAC, we focus on political. We have one very specific, very effective angle for combating BDS. But the ICC pulls resources from all of the campus organizations so that like they're tapped in on all angles. The Israel on Campus Coalition is a coordinating group at the front line of the battle against BDS. We built up this massive national political campaign to crush them and to fight back and to fight fire with fire. What we saw was a growing global movement to destroy Israel that was manifesting on American college campuses. It makes sense that they would try to poison the next generation. The one thing every member of Congress and president and ambassador and newspaper editor has in common is by and large, they spent a little bit of time on a college campus, and probably those were formative years. The Israel on Campus Coalition is at the center of the lobby's response to BDS. There are about 100 
maybe 120 now professionals that are working for a dozen national ICC partner organizations like APAC and Hasbara Fellowships and Stand With Us and Hillel and Chabad and API. Stand With Us and the ICC have a particularly close relationship. The Israel on Campus Coalition, they really oversee like the whole movement. They're sort of the ones that like have the bird's eye view. Literally like next week, a BDS resolution comes to campus. So the IC will be the ones, they'll organize a conference call with all the partners. So they might say, okay, stay with us, we need a little bit more of your help because we need something regarding like what's my BDS resolution. The campus newspaper wants us to write like an op-ed can you guys help like the op-ed? So they'll sort of be the ones and they'll sort of be overseeing it. One of Tony's fellow researchers at the Israel Project had also worked with Stand With Us. One evening, Amanda told him how the work she'd been asked to do often made her feel uneasy. And stuff we produced, yeah. felt was like... Yeah. It would be like pictures of Palestinian kids with a knife. Those videos of like kids gonna like stab people and like we need to put this on Facebook and they probably make memes like do like graphics about like that. It was in like presentations of Palestinian terrorists at the college students. And it was like on our Facebook pages. Yeah, you told me about that guy who was like telling me to like use racist, like use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they going to universities and using that kind of language? Or? Yeah. Universities, articles, Facebook, everything. At the Israel Project's offices, Amanda confided further in Tony. Her boss at Stand With Us instructed her to call BDS a racist hate group as often as possible, she said, because it polls well. Stand With Us also had what she described as a covert group which would slander people as anti-Semites. It made her feel uncomfortable. Amanda recalled how Stand With Us was involved at her university. Students who criticized Israel's treatment of Palestinians were routinely accused of anti-Semitism. The pro-Israel side would say things like... <laughs> say things like, why are they targeting Israel and not other Arab countries? You know, like, look at all this bad stuff happening to other places and... Um, you know, and Israel is like a democracy. Like, they would just say all this stuff that was, like, so irrelevant. Do you think that there have been well-intentioned activists on American campuses who have found themselves in very difficult situations because these pros or groups have tarnished them as anti-Semites? Oh, absolutely. Stand With Us holds an annual conference in Los Angeles. Its focus is on how to fight the BDS movement. To reveal the true nature of BDS, a venomous, deceitful, anti-peace, anti-coexistence movement that will settle for nothing short of the annihilation of the Jewish state. Jacob Bain from the Israel on Campus Coalition linked BDS to the rise in anti-Semitic hate crimes in America. Anti-Semitism is increasing in general, right? In the same way that we're seeing anti-Semitism increase in the community, we're seeing these awful, terrifying desecrations of Jewish cemeteries. The campus is no exception. At a social event held by a pro-Israel advocacy group, Tony finds out more about Stand With Us. Many here are recent graduates with backgrounds in student politics. 
I was the chief of staff for my friend who was our student senator. We had Stan with us write some checks, but we didn't let them put their logo on it. What? It's just our names on the logo. We didn't want that association because on Berkeley campus, if you don't know, they hate Stan with us. As well as working behind the scenes to provide funds, Stand With Us helps pro-Israel groups denounce students who support equal rights for Palestinians. We've used Stand With Us strategically on my campus to have them publish stuff when we wanted stuff published. One girl that was running for our student senate, the last name is Dick, to my The summer of 2014, the Gaza bombings happened. There's a lot of activity in the Bay Area, a lot of protests. You hear like, intifada, intifada, intifada. So, and I asked someone, I was like, oh, what does that mean? When Sumaya stood for the student senate at Berkeley, the Arabic word meaning uprising inspired her election slogan. My last name means uh, faith and governance, a way of life. There was other hashtags, so it was like Din for the win, Din Dynasty, um, and then I really liked them. So when I launched my campaign, it just seemed fitting to launch it with, um, you know, hashtag Din Tifada. She ran on the hashtag Din Tifada. That's her, like, Din Tifada, her last name's Din. It's a Maya Din. And we're like, this isn't OK. Stand With Us and launched a social media assault on Samaya's campaign and her character. We had a campaign party, it was a launch party, and an hour later, I get, I'm getting all these messages. We had Stan with us attack this girl in an ar article, well, at least on their Facebook, right? They shared the screenshots and stuff mm -hmm. and talked about, like, this isn't okay. The next day, Stand With Us completely took my campaign slogan out of, you know, context. It's just an Arabic word, meaning uprising. And they redefined it to then serve their own purpose. The redefinition to me was killing of all Jews. Samaya received a barrage of abuse on social media. They called you a frustrated, uh, sexually repressed woman. <laughs> they said you were scum. They wanted to kick you out of the country. How hard was all that to deal with? Yeah, I, I distanced myself from that. I would go out and I would be walking on campus. Everyone would be looking at me. I felt like I needed to hide. It took me three days. I, I didn't sleep. I was just like, what? What's going on? We don't want Santa Claus's name, you know, on our name. have all sorts of followers, and some of those people are a little crazy. You have people that are saying, like, that person should die. This girl was getting death threats. People are like, she's a terrorist, blah, blah, blah. involved are they on campus politics then? Like even they if it's money. Bad. They get money. But it's rare that they put their name on something because the leadership that I helped create on that campus is aware that it ruins relationships.
At the Israel on Campus Coalition in Washington, Tony discovered that the lobby is deliberately adopting a clandestine approach on campuses. We should stand behind our work, not in front of it. It's not helpful for Stand With Us to say to a, a pro-Israel student or the Israel Project to say to a pro-Israel student, oh, sure, we'll help you, but put our you have to put our logo on it. We're working like so closely with Stand With Us and we have such a tight partnership with them today that like it's totally seamless. Tony also discovered that anonymity is a key strand of the campaign against BDS. If one of these terrorists on campus wants to disrupt a pro-Israel lecture or something and like unfurl a banner or whatever else, we're going to investigate them, look into bad stuff they've done. That stuff becomes very useful in the moment. And there are any number of ways to push it out. The only thing is that we do it securely and anonymously. And that's the key. It was a Sunday. I was in the kitchen. My partner was in the living room with my daughter. Came in with her laptop, and she said, you've got to see this. Bill Mullen has been a campaigner for the BDS movement for years. His wife had been sent a link to a website containing a letter addressed to her. This letter purported to be by a former student who said, that she had been sexually harassed by me, and she had found other students at Purdue who had had the same experience, and she was writing this letter to tell their story. With the anti-Israel people, what's most effective, what we found, at least in the last year, is you do the opposition research, put up some anonymous website, and then put up targeted Facebook ads. And within a very short time, within about 48 hours, we were able to establish that these multiple sites that we had found attacking me had been taken out almost at the same time and that they were clearly the work of the same people. Every few hours you drip out a new piece of the opposition research. It's psychological warfare, drives them crazy. One of the accounts said, that in the process of supposedly putting my hand on her, I'd invited her to a Palestine organizational meeting. And I thought, well, that's... You're sort of putting your cards on the table there, whoever you are. We found out that a student at Purdue, who I work with, had also been targeted. A former activist with Students for Justice in Palestine agreed to speak only with her face concealed. It said that I would get drunk and go and have sex with multiple guys, and that's just a huge attack on my character and a massive lie. My parents were very upset. They immediately told me to quit my involvement with SJP. They either shut down or they spent time responding to it and investigating it, which is time they can't spend attacking Israel. That's incredibly effective. The main focus was to attack my reputation and my character, pretty much to mess with me so that I don't want to continue my involvement with SJP. It was really an attempt by people who didn't know us to think, maybe I can destroy this marriage at the very least. Maybe I can cause them horrendous personal suffering. The same letter purporting to be harassment to my wife used the name of our daughter. I think that was the worst moment I think we thought, these people will do anything. They're capable of doing anything. Could you send me some of these websites? I'd be very curious just to see what they look like. I, could, I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> you couldn't? Okay. Yeah. But, you know, Canary Mission is a good example. Canary Mission is highly, highly effective to the extent that we monitor the Students for Justice in Palestine and their allies. I remember it was the morning I was getting ready for school. I was about to graduate at this point in a pretty cheery mood, I'd say. I got a Facebook message from one of my friends. She goes, hey, Marcel, I don't mean to freak you out, but I think you should see this. I click on it, and then I see it's a picture of me, and it's my name, and it's a profile about me. When I saw that, this was a website dedicated to taking down pro-BDS activists and painting us all as terrorists and anti-Semitic. It was chaos. It was chaos in my mind. What are people going to think when they 
look at my name on Google? Are they gonna think I'm a terrorist? Are they gonna think I, I don't like Jewish people? And they're picking out individuals who they think are critical of Israel and they're smearing them. And they're telling them that what's gonna happen here is if you don't cease and desist from acting like this, we in the end will do much to destroy your career. A few years later, these individuals are applying for jobs within your company. Canary Mission's promotional video threatens to pass these smears onto prospective employers. To ensure that today's radicals are not tomorrow's employees. It was shattering to me because I had to look for a job. I had to start my life. And now I had this website smearing my name before I even got a chance to really make a name for myself. Somebody did contact my employer and ask for me to be fired based on my pro-Palestine activism. They said that, um, you know, if they continued to employ me, that their values are anti-Semitic. It can be really scary at first. I was mostly harassed via Twitter. They were tweeting me like every two or three days. They take screenshots, even way back to my Facebook pictures that don't even look like me anymore. I'm just digging and digging through my, my online presence. They're terrified of Canary Mission, and it's about time. We had always been afraid of ending up on there. It was like very personal. They see us as such a threat that they have to kind of twist and turn and delve into our personal lives. As if they were trying to scare us into stopping our work. Their Twitter campaign is relentless. Every picture that I post on Facebook, it goes onto one of their websites with every tweet that I put in. Every hashtag I post on Instagram, it goes into one of their files. The research operation is very high tech. When I got here a few years ago, the budget was like three thousand dollars. Today, it's like a million and a half or more. Probably it's like two million even at this point. I don't even know. It's, it's huge. It's a massive budget. We've got major political consulting firms on retainer that are here all the time. We have our own opposition researchers. We have a lot of communications capabilities. And what's most interesting about it, I think, is that 90% of the people who pay attention to this space very closely have no idea what we're actually doing, which I, I like. As he left his meeting at the ICC, Tony reflected on the way Jacob Baim had reacted to his questions about Canary Mission. We do it securely and anonymously, and that's the key. It sounds very similar to like a Canary Mission and that kind of thing. Is that, yeah. yeah. Are you guys like in touch with them at all, or is there any kind of, no? No, Canary Mission is totally anonymous. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 I was it's wondering. Hard to, hard to figure out who's behind it. Canary Mission is highly, highly effective um, to the extent that we monitor the Students for Justice in Palestine and their allies. <laughs> them, we're doing it back. I mean, not we, but um, this is an anonymous group. We don't know who's behind it. I would ask where they get their money from, because ultimately that tells you where the control is. In part two, we reveal for the first time who set up and finances Canary Mission. He called a group of us to ask us what we thought. I told him actually that was a bad idea, but he did anyway. And how the pro-Israel lobby uses smears to try to change American law. Investigate us for what? For doing nothing wrong? In part one, how anonymous websites smear supporters of the BDS movement. Use the name of our daughter. They're capable of doing anything. It's psychological warfare. Drives them crazy. Not saying ownership, but I think it's not serious. Yeah. Our undercover reporter, Tony, is having a coffee with Eric, his boss at the Israel Project. Tony wanted to find out more about Canary Mission. There's a guy named Adam Milstein who you might want to meet. He's a convicted felon. Um, that's the bad way to describe him. He's a real estate mogul. When I was working with him when I said APAC, I was literally emailing back and forth with him while he was in jail. 
but he's loaded. I mean, he's close to half a million dollars. Adam Milstein has become a central figure in the lobby. His foundation funds numerous pro-Israel organizations. He also sits on the boards of APAC's National Council, the Israel on Campus Coalition, and Stand With Us. Our reporter filmed him alongside Jacob Baim from the Israel on Campus Coalition at the Stand With Us conference in Los Angeles. The two men had lengthy private discussions. Milstein is close to probably the wealthiest donor to the pro-Israel lobby, Sheldon Adelson. Adelson's money helped Milstein expand the Israeli-American Council into a major new force within the lobby. Adelson arrived at the 2016 IAC conference with Rudy Giuliani, now an advisor to President Trump. An IAC video from the conference shows Milstein and Adelson discussing their partnership. You said you see the vision and you tell us, go and do it. And we took your orders and we made it happen. And we took your money. <laughs> There's somebody else around that can give you 50 million? No, there is no... Shall... Eric is wary of Adelson's relationship with a U.S. president. He's really impulsive. He gets a call from you know, Donald Trump. You know, comes to get all the pro Trump organizations to start helping us. He starts pressing their arms and putting pressure on them. Like, I give you a million dollars. You better start putting out TV ads. Like, what the f it's not our goal. You know, it's not our mission. Tony attended the Israeli American Council's annual conference. At a party, he spotted the IAC's chairman, Adam Milstein. Milstein told Tony how critics of Israel should be handled. First of all, investigate who they are, what's their agenda. They're picking on the Jews because it's easy, because it's popular. We need to expose what they really are. And we need to expose the fact that they have the everything we believe in. And we need to put them on the run. Right now, they can do whatever they like, terrorize us, and we are... How do we put them on the run, though? Doing it by exposing who they are, what they are, the fact that they're racist, the fact that they're big of the dying democracy. Do you think there's a good role to just naming them as anti-Semites? Not just anti-Semites, it's too simple. We need to present them for what they really are. They're anti-freedom, they're anti-Christian, they're anti-democracy. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Numerous groups from the pro-Israel lobby were attending the conference. An Israeli official gave them a message to pass on to BDS supporters in America. Everybody out there who has to do anything with BDS should ask himself twice, do I want to be on this side or do I want to be on the other side? If I'm submitting to BDS, what would be the effect? We've got the budget. We can bring things to the table that are quite different. In episode one of The Lobby USA, Tony discovered that the Israeli government has launched a covert campaign to gather information on American citizens. We have three different sub-campaigns. Data gathering, working on activist organization, money trail. The Israeli official named one organization that was a partner in its covert campaign, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or FDD. This is something that only a country with its resources can do the best. We have FDD, we have others working on this. She names the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy as an agent for this foreign government going after American citizens. I mean, that quote is a smoking gun. Yeah. Sorry, are you Jonathan? Hey, I'm Tony. Hi. Hi, I met up with uh, Benny Wine. Jonathan Shanza works for the FDD. He produces research on the financing of armed groups. Yeah, I've, I'm very interested in getting involved in like BDS activity and stuff like that. Hopefully um, anti-BDS. <laughs> if you had 
on tape a senior Russian or Iranian or even Canadian official saying that they were running covert operations to spy on Americans and using an organization like the Foundation for Defense of Democracies as a front group, I think it would be a bombshell. Shanzo was invited to talk at the training workshops that Tony attended. The think tanks are the folks that used to work in government, have PhDs, and decided not to become professors. In the Middle Eastern Studies field, academics have failed, and that's why people like me are considered useful at least to some. To call it the foundation for the defense of democracies is a misnomer. It's the foundation for the defense of Israel. When you strip away all the layers of the onion and you look at what you really have, what you have is a foundation that is dedicated to one goal, and that is defending Israel at every turn. The FDD's mission has been to associate students who support BDS through links to charities and pressure groups, ultimately to Hamas, which governs the besieged territory of Gaza. We found out that there was a coordinator who was being paid to make sure that the activists from a certain group called SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, who was working with all the different SJP chapters around the country to make sure that they all have the same message. So we said, wait a minute, who are these people? That kind of sounds like a little bit like a network. We took a little bit of a deeper dive. We found out that there was one organization that was, in fact, a mothership. Shanza's mothership is a group called American Muslims for Palestine. Here's the remarkable thing, is that this organization has employees that used to work for Hamas charities here in the United States. Many employees, as a they used to work for the Holy Land Foundation. Does that name ring a bell to anyone? The Holy Land Foundation was the largest Islamic charity in the United States. In the aftermath of 9-11, the government accused it of funding terrorism. With this action, we go beyond the Al-Qaeda network to target groups whose violent actions are designed to destroy the Middle East peace process. Hamas emerged as a resistance movement challenging Israel's occupation of Palestinian land. The United States lists it as a foreign terrorist organization. Five members of the Holy Land Foundation were later convicted of sending money to Hamas. Almost 90% of all those Arab and Muslims that were targeted in the United States post 9-11 were targeted because of their engagement with the Palestine issue. They had nothing to do with being members of Al-Qaeda, have no relationship whatsoever to what's so-called transnational terrorism. There's been a very strong trend uh, from Israel and its advocates since the September 11, 2001 attacks to portray Israel as part of a civilizational war where Israel is on the Western side and Israel's critics are on the side of the terrorists. According to reports in Israeli newspapers in 2008, Prime Minister Netanyahu said 9-11 had been good for Israel. The attacks had swung American public opinion in its favor. It's not surprising one of the largest cases that we had in this country was the shutting down of the Holy Land Foundation. If you look at all those that were targeted, were targeted in relations to the Palestine-Israel uh, conflict and their engagement politically. Turns out there are three individuals currently working for what we'll call a mothership that they used to work for the Holy Land Foundation. Three former volunteers at the Holy Land Foundation are now involved with American Muslims for Palestine. None of these individuals has been accused of any wrongdoing in the United States. So I'm thinking, aha, okay, terror financiers. I used to do this for a living. I used to work for the Treasury Department tracking terrorist money. I know these guys. What's going on here? We have no affiliation with any foreign organization. We don't receive money from overseas. And this mothership organization is a very small organization. 
But the pro-Israel advocacy class heard another message. He was that the primary driver of the BDS movement in America is all populated by people who are former Hamas charity employees. This is not a grassroots organization. This is not a grassroots movement. It is being coordinated by very bad people, and it needs to be made known. Think tanks like the FDD play an important role for Israel in the media. Their selective use of evidence is often presented as legitimate academic research. They try to educate people to understand that Israel is effectively a Western liberal democracy in the sea of terrorist states, which is the Arab world. The other goal is to intimidate and to smear people. Shanzer is invited by pro-Israel congressmen to provide evidence before subcommittees on terrorism in the Middle East. He uses them to insinuate that prominent activists for Palestinian equal rights are linked to armed groups. The AMP's founder and president, Hatem Bazian, was one of two featured speakers at a 2004 fundraising dinner in California. Incidentally, the other speaker at this dinner was Mohammed al Mazain, who is currently in jail for his role in the Holy Land Foundation and for providing financial support to Hamas. When you enter it into the congressional record, now people are begin, begin to think that there's some legitimacy to it. So this dumping of utter nonsense and garbage into the congressional record, into a legitimate hearing, will have a effect down the line. There's also Osama Abu Ershad. He is currently the national coordinator and policy director for AMP. Mr. Abu Ershad also runs a pro-Hamas newspaper in Virginia. They made Palestine as a front on the war on terrorism. It was Al-Qaeda that attacked the United States. It wasn't Hamas or any Palestinian organization. It was Al-Qaeda. I should note here that our open, research, uh, open source research did not indicate that AMP or any of these individuals are currently involved in illegal activity. He himself in his testimony in Congress, he says, we have no evidence of any wrongdoing by this organization, but still you have to investigate them. So investigate us for what? For doing nothing wrong? The fact it's rubbish does not mean that people don't listen to it, right? Shanza's allegations that American students are somehow connected to armed groups in the Middle East has become part of the lobby's attempt to demonize BDS. Organizations that have spread throughout the world via a network of carefully constructed proxies. We should promote the fact that according to Jonathan Shanzer, no terrorism, he said a group of people who were active in funding Hamas have now formed a group of American Muslims for Palestine. Shanzer at Testify said they're a leading driver of the BDS campaign. They're the most important sponsor and organizers of SJP. We have to make it clear in every way possible that they are being funded and trained by vicious lovers of Hamas. Hello there. Hi, hi. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Tony spoke again to his contacts at the Algemeine newspaper. They want him to go undercover at a rally supporting BDS. They want Tony to find a connection between the activists he's supposed to spy on and the Holy Land Foundation. There's a long history of crimes associated with the BDS movement that have been judged as such by the US court. For example, the Holy Land Foundation. Are these people still active and present within the movement? Who seems to be the people running the show here, doing the acknowledgement of any sponsors. This is an industrial business. You know, they're all interconnected. This is not me just spouting off because I'm paranoid. There have been actual cases, like the Holy Land case that happened a few years ago. A lot of these guys had um, worked with those people, and they themselves have not yet been indicted, but they're all interconnected. Part of the reason why that is so crucial is because when you're making lines from one organization to the other, eventually you make a line to Hamas, to Hezbollah, to Iran. Sounds good. Well, we're grateful to have you. Let's, uh, let's see how it goes.
While he considered his undercover mission for the Algaminer, Tony set up a meeting with Jonathan Shanzer. It was at the office of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Hey, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Good, good. to see you. You too. Uh, at their you... earlier meeting, Shanzer had stressed the importance of links that connected students who support BDS to the Holy Land Foundation and then Hamas. Now he was more downbeat. The lobby is apparently failing in its attempts to discredit the movement. BDS has taken everybody's surprise. It's come up, you know, uh, behind everyone's back and bit them on the ass. Yeah, that's a, a, a complete mess. Um, I can tell you that I don't think anybody's doing a good job. Um, we're not even doing a good job. We did some good research, but we haven't figured out how to do anything with it. Shanza is unhappy that his alleged links between Students for Justice in Palestine and Hamas have not been publicized more widely. The stuff that I share with your group, our hope was to really, you know, make this something that people could sink their teeth into, but no one has turned it into... No one's weaponized it, is probably the best way of, of, of describing it. The slurs the lobby once relied on are no longer working. Personally, I think anti-Semitism um, uh, as a smear is not what it used to be. Shanz is now trying to link BDS to a small Palestinian faction that once was involved in militancy, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine. So you got Hamas on one hand, you got PFLP on the other. Sooner or later, this stuff will come to light. What have you found so far? We'll come out with something when I've got enough. We found indications that there could be some research <laughs> to produce. Their strategy is to fill the pipeline of as much research and information that creates what I consider to be is the civil society assassination of Arab Muslim Palestinians in such a way that they will not have an entry into the debate. Shanza claims he's found yet another means of discrediting the BDS movement, this time connecting it to the Muslim Brotherhood. The problem is the Muslim Brotherhood is not an illegal organization in the United States. So you can say that that's bad, but there's, if there's no legal link, there's no, um, you know, um, there's no law enforcement angle on any level, then it becomes really hard to win. The Muslim Brotherhood is a loose international movement which endorses the political expression of Islamic values. Congress is now considering designating it as a terrorist organization. They are moving right now with a bill to try to ban the Muslim Brotherhood movement. So the strategy that is being deployed, which is create the demonization, filling the garbage can with as much material as possible, especially from a Congress and Senate. We've been dealing with the radical Islam from the Islamic Republic since 1979, okay. Okay. Muslim Brotherhood since the 1920s. You've got the Islamic State, you've got the Islamic Republic. Their hatred for Israel, their Islamist ideology is what is what really motivates the terrorism that they carry out. You have to attack their weaknesses better than they attack your weaknesses. That's war. Why they're doing this? Why they're going after our organizations? It's all, always connected to the issue of Palestine. They always try to connect us, to connect dots that they don't exist. Terrorism is a very effective word. And what a lot of people in the lobby try to do is describe pro-Arab or pro-Palestinian groups as terrorist groups. There's no doubt that when you employ the tactic of identifying Muslim or Arab or Palestinian groups as terrorist organizations that you're promoting Islamophobia. Shanza is a popular speaker at the pro-Israel campus events that Tony attends. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Welcome. A panel discussion at George Mason University is an opportunity to promote the FDD's research to a friendly audience. My organization, FDD, earlier this year concluded a deep dive study into the fiscal and corporate sponsors of BDS, and we found several troubling connections to the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas an Islamist supremacist organization that seeks nothing less than the annihilation of the state of Israel. I recently published research just this week showing that BDS, uh, get, uh, BDS groups get help from other 
uh, Palestinian terrorist organizations like the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. The problem is that most students don't know who is behind BDS, and most Americans don't know. And this is why BDS is gaining traction. AMP is the de facto national leadership of Students for Justice in Palestine. There is an actual direct connection between the people who are involved in raising money for Hamas and people who are involved in BDS activism on American campuses today. Pollock claims that SJP is just a front to hide the real agenda of American Muslims for Palestine. You'll notice their name is Students for Justice in Palestine. You don't hear the word Islamic, you don't hear the word Muslim in, in that name, and you hear the word justice which is kind of a buzzword on campuses today. Everyone's for justice, right? You're not for injustice. The crowd that's kind of behind the scenes is actually a very Islamic radical cause. And if you actually get like into the weeds on SJP, they've aligned with groups that are for the, not just the destruction of Israel, the destruction of America. That's a narrative that suits Israel because it takes the pressure off Israel to actually end what it's doing to Palestinians but it's an incredibly dangerous narrative for the whole world, and I think we're all paying the price of it. Pollock even accuses Jewish supporters of BDS of being in league with Hamas. Jewish voice for peace, or as I call it, Jewish voice for Hamas. Um, they, it'd be like having a group called like, you know, African Americans for slavery. You know, it's like, it's crazy, right? A lot of the JVP people um, are not, um, not Jewish. Um, they've had a, a real problem of like people basically pretending to be Jews because the anti-Israel activism sound it's a little more sexy. You're, you're here. To, you're here speaking uh, speaking with the rabbi. I, I, I work for for Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, I mean, we're, we're we're a Jewish organization. I mean, again, I think that's another kind of a absurd absurd claim. When you talk about SJP and when you talk about BDS, you talk about them as a hate group. Um, as, a, as a movement that absolutely endorses violence against civilians, not military conflict, but violence against civilians, AKA terrorism. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Tony's boss, Eric, was also at the event. He's old friends with Noah Pollock. And I want to hire Tony in the Israel press. Tony's uh, another troublemaker from the UK. He's a good guy, Noah's the best. Thing. As Tony left the event with Eric, the conversation turned to smearing BDS supporters. Eric said wealthy pro-Israel donors now have the freedom to fight Israel's critics however they want. In this country, you have these billionaire types who are starting to realize, like, oh, wow, I could build my own. I don't need to participate in the Republican or Democratic parties. I could build my own apparatus and have influence from Los Angeles or Detroit. And Adam Milstein is one of those guys. And he funds, he funds the Israel Project. He does a lot of great work. Eric then made a remarkable claim when Tony asked about Canary Mission. Who are the people involved with them? It's him. It's him. Adam Milstein. Yeah, I don't know who he hired to oversee it. Adam Milstein. He's the guy who funds it. We need to expose the fact that they're anti everything we believe in. We need to put them on the run. It's Adam Milstein. He funds the Israel Project and he's funding the Canary Mission website. Yeah, which is, which is interesting because it, it makes it seem as though we're a part of it, but we're not. Actually, I was involved with the effort to start with the name and shame. He called a group of us to ask us what we thought. I told him actually I thought it was a bad idea, but he did anyway. They've lost the political argument. They can now do nothing but resort to personal smears against us. They can't engage us in discussions of the occupation. They can't defend apartheid. They can't defend the bombings in Gaza, but they can try to destroy our lives. Kind of really desperate and pathetic almost, you know, going after students, um, trying to compromise their futures because they're trying to fight for social justice. I know a guy actually is working with Adam on all sorts of digital spying. There's a, a group of like anonymous people who are, have a very sophisticated digital strategy for exposing these people and making sure that stuff stays with them. There's no one on their side doing it, so you don't have to worry about your reputation. In episode four, how the pro-Israel lobby is fighting the public relations war. 
the activism has to be like very provocative and potential getting and just like a total like no given. And how the Israel project is laying the ground for a future conflict with Hezbollah. We have to be ready because that, that war will be one of the lost, you know, the court of public opinion and not yeah. uh, the 